Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, Keens. Anyone out there with Keens on? <laughs> Woo! So yeah, I'm a, I'm a designer. I'm, a, I'm an industrial designer. I went to Ohio State University. OH? Love it. Yeah. Oh, Michigan sucks. Anyway, Ohio State has a uh, industrial design program. That's, that's, an, that's a good word. Sucks is OK. It's not on your list. Um, so yeah, I went to Ohio State, studied industrial design. My father was a shoemaker. Uh, I'm, I was born in the UK. We, we moved to the States when I was seven, uh, 1971. And uh, enrolled in uh, university, not when I was seven, but a little bit later. And uh, started to follow, just decided to follow my father's uh, footsteps and get into the shoe business. Uh, I liked shoes. I, every, I always wore shoes. I always worked with him on projects. And uh, you know, kind of knew, got to know that industry quite well. Uh, early on in my design career, I never really thought about intended, the unintended consequences that designers uh, and products that we design can have on us. And this, this is what I'm really concerned about now. So um, I'm now a furniture designer. And again, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the unintended consequences of some of the devices we use uh, for work these days, which you're all sitting in right now, um, uh, generally the chair. So uh, a couple of years ago, I came across this quote by uh, uh, a Scottish anthropologist by the name of Tim Ingold. And it was really, it really rang with me because it, he talked about these two items that we designed as, uh, as creatures that you know, started to make tools that have really removed us from our animal and uh, our animal past and the earth that we actually walk and, and used to sit on. And that is the shoe and the chair. So when we started designing or making shoes, it really just put protection for when we started making you know, paving roads and we wanted to run through areas where there were thorns and, and rocks. This device, this shoe, which is really just a tool, literally and figuratively took us away, removed us from our animal past. We were no longer like the apes the, that we used to be. Uh, we were evolved. We were all of a sudden civilized. The next device we created was this chair, uh, which is a relatively new innovation. Really, only since the Industrial Revolution have we mass produced chairs, 150 years. So we've only been sitting really for uh, you know for 150 years. Before that, we we worked mostly on our feet. Uh, we would squat. You know, we, thousands of years ago, squatting was a very common posture uh, that we, we we would take. Uh, we would lean against logs and things like that. So, and these are things that uh, I like to think about: is what were we like thousands and thousands of years ago? I always try and take take off all of those things that I know about modern society and try and put myself in that time and designing for humans, designing for the human animal. And I think that's very important because then we can avoid unintended consequences. So let's look at the shoe. Some crazy designs out there. Fortunately, I'm not a woman and I don't have to wear high heels and squeeze my feet into these tiny little uh, uh, narrow, this is obviously from the Renaissance, top left. Um, but you know, it, it was all about fashion. It wasn't really. It became uh, more about fashion. It started out as a functional tool to protect us from the earth, but it's really become a fashion pro uh, item. And some of the unintended consequences we all know about: our, our our feet, our toes don't don't spread anymore like they were when we were a little baby. Even today, when you're you know when you have a baby, the the toes are quite open. You take your shoes off now, and you're your feet are like this. This is not how we were born. So you'll notice my, all of my shoes are, are quite broad. So I did a lot of research uh, and uh, cast a lot of feet. So I started working for these different shoe companies. And I never thought about where this, why we, we made the shoes this shape. I'd never really thought about it. I was just told, hey, design the next version of the Jazz 4000 running shoe when I worked for Saucony designed the Jazz 5000. So they would give me the last shape, which was the foot shape, and I would design the next version of that shoe. I would never question where that last shape came from until years later when I just started to think about why. Why was it that shape? And I started casting a lot of my friends' feet. And I didn't just cast the inbred New England feet of my friends in, uh, <laughs> in Rhode Island, but you know, friends from all over the world that uh, you know, the Japanese feet have, or Japanese have very, very broad feet. Um, uh, uh, African 
feet, uh, South American feet, uh, North, North European feet, and I kind of got a library of, of shapes that I started to build my own um, footwear concept on, which I called Keen, which we launched in 2003, and really was a, built on this idea of a, a proper f shaped foot, a uh, proper shaped shoe that was foot shaped and offered protection. Uh, I, I now think about other things that uh, have unintended consequences. How do we work today? How do we use, what sort of tools do we used to use and what tools are we using now and what are the unintended consequences? So we used to run through the, the jungle of throwing spears, trying to find you know, game, go hunting and gathering. This was our work. We would squat, we would, squat, we would lean against a log, we would, we would sit on a rock when we were uh, needing to rest. But uh, now what do we do for work? You know, this guy's on his way to work, he's running a little late, stuck in traffic, breaks out his computer. This is work today. It's, it's a little different. So the unintended consequences, we'll get into those a little bit later. Um, even uh, even uh, a device that we all have in our pocket now, what are some of the unintended consequences? TextNeck, has anyone ever heard of TextNeck? You all see kids all day long doing this. And now they're developing what's called turtleneck, which you take into old age. I mean, you'll, you'll eventually, even kids who are eight years old are developing this. And it's something that if you don't teach kids how to stand properly and to, to you know, uh, unfortunately, to try and text here or you know, to really have proper posture, it's something that will, will stay with them for the rest of their lives. Unintended consequences of a design of a very convenient device that we all need in this, in this day and age, but something we should really think about. Um, this thing is rather sensitive. Um, again, the evolution of, of man or evolution of human. You know, right in the middle is where I, th I think we should remain. Unfortunately, we're now on the far right. So, and all this sedentary uh, behavior, all the sedentary posture we were taking all day. These are things I didn't think about when I first took that, that job at uh, Saucony. I was, a, you know, I was assigned a cubicle just like everybody else, and I sat just like everybody else, just like in school when I was told to sit down, stay still, pay attention. All I wanted to do was fidget. Fidgeting is not good for you, they told me. Um, so these are, these are things that you only become aware of when you get a little bit older. But kids should be taught, I think, to really question why. Why is, why is it like that? Why do we all sit still and try and pay attention? All I want to do is, is, is fidget around in class, and I, I feel more energized. I feel more uh, present and awake uh, when I'm moving. And this is true. We're, we're animals. We need to move. We need to move around. So I, I think about design now as, as uh, a real holistic Thing. What, what is the end result? What is the, the consequence of the design that I'm putting forth? I want it to be, uh, I want it to do less bad than any previous design that came before. Uh, think about the brain. What does the brain need? The brain needs blood flow. The brain needs oxygen to perform its best. So kids, workers, when they're learning, when they're working, if you have higher rate of blood flow, if you have better oxygenation, your brain is more efficient. If you're a CEO of a company and you have a lot of people sitting down, which Frederick Taylor in at the beginning of the, the Industrial Revolution said the best way to control a group of people is to have them sit down. And this is sort of shortly after the innovation of mass production of chairs when you can buy them at Sears Roebuck for $10.50. Uh, we never thought about that. Okay, we're gonna have everyone sit down to control them. They're more passive, but they're not as efficient workers. They, they're not thinking creatively. Uh, what, is the, what are the results of obesity, uh, or the, of all the sedentary lifestyles? So this is sort of, you know, shortly after the introduction when people started to get PCs, the internet was about to begin. This is um, 10 to 15% of the nation was 30 pounds overweight. Okay, BMI of 30, uh, and this is for a person who's just five foot four. This is, the, w the ones that are in white aren't, um, hadn't, reg hadn't uh, given any results, so, but you'll see. I'm just gonna show a few slides here. Um, this is uh, just 10 years later. Um, we got some states that are 
of the population is, over, is obese, 30% uh, BMI. And good Lord, this is very sensitive. Uh, anyway, in 2010, um, we have 30% of the entire population of the US. And this is, so this is uh, no, five years ago. And the, these are, this is not just from sitting, it's obviously from the, the prevalence of, of uh, inexpensive, high caloric food that we all, we all tend to consume. It's convenient, it's inexpensive, but it's also part of our sedentary lifestyle that's, that's, uh, that's adding, adding this on. And this is adding, putting $3 billion into, um, uh, each week is spent by businesses to fight this epidemic of obesity. And this is primarily obviously with, with workers, with older, older people. I'm not talking about kids right now. Um, where did this chair come from? The, uh, the science of, of ergonomics was really, again, developed sort of at the turn of the century, uh, sh shortly after the Industrial Revolution. And we looked at you know, the measurement of man, and it was, it was primarily uh, developed, the, the science of ergonomics, the human factors was developed for the automobile industry and for uh, weapons of war for World War I. The aircraft, tanks, um, all, these, all these devices were for static postures. You were in a, a cabin controlling a wheel or shooting, you know, shooting down the enemy. Um, these same, the same science of, of human factors of sitting were then applied to the, to the offices. And chairs were all designed around the static posture of sitting still in an office and in, in a school. We're not static. We, sh we want to be moving around. We need to be energized. We need to be collaborating and engaged with each other. It's not conducive. So I, I uh, started standing uh, when I started my own consulting business in Jamestown, Rhode Island in 1994. I decided I'd worked for a couple of companies in-house for five years, and then I started my own, my own consulting business, and I decided I wanted to try standing. I didn't like sitting. I was no longer working for the man, so I could do whatever the hell I wanted. <laughs> uh, so I, I designed a, a, a studio space that was all upright desk, and I found it was a little bit of an endurance test to stand all day. So I started um, playing with, let's, I, started, I started playing with a, uh, a device. Let me just go back, sorry. I just want to go back to the history of the chair, and again, it was, a, it was a device that was intended in, initially for, for leisure. It was, we saw our kings and queens and royalty and the pharaohs all seated. Deities were all shown seated. seated. So we aspired to be like them. We aspired to have a chair. Every, everyone wanted to have a chair. We couldn't afford them. They, we, we had to make them. Uh, so it was, a, it was an aspirational tool. Um, this is a... a picture of the spine in 1911 when we we're still very physical with our work, a lot more agricultural work, working in factories, just starting. Um, and then over a course of 80 years, our spines have shrunk and we have this overextended S-curve. These are both standing spines. So the one on the right is a very strong standing spine. The one on the left is a very slumped uh, standing spine. And this is just 80 years. This is a typical spine for the period. This is not just one, you know, two different individuals. These are typical profiles. This is what we've done to ourselves. This is an unintended consequence of sitting for up to eight, nine hours, ten hours a day is what we, on average, we sit that much every single day. So everyone get up. No, I'm kidding. You can stay. You can stay. There you go. So I started tinkering in my barn with different ideas of standing support because I found standing was a little in, a bit of an endurance test. So I built all sorts of contraptions. And uh, so since 1994, since before I even started the Keen uh, Company, I uh, started tinkering. And I was doing it really just as a tool that I needed for myself to keep myself energized. I wasn't thinking, oh, I want to start a furniture company. I knew nothing about furniture. I was deep into the, into the world of, of footwear. And I wanted to uh, just keep myself energized. So I created this, this upright uh, prop, it was like a standing support, which eventually became this. This is what we launched with um, two years ago, two and a half years ago in May 2012. Uh, it's the, we call it the Locus uh, Upright Desk and the Locus Seat. 
And you notice the seat has a great deal of movement built into it. And I actually have a, a product up here if you want to come up and try it. It's, uh, it gives you a feeling of the posture, which is a very familiar posture. You, you know when you go to a friend's house and everyone ends up in the, in the kitchen because the counter is just the right height for perching. And it's a very comfortable place to be. So that's really what this is. It's kind of replicating, just taking a little bit of load off, but it's not putting your lumbar under that, uh, that horrendous back compression, the anterior part of your spine. When you sit down, you're not just um, compressing the anterior part of your spine, but you're compressing all of your organs. You're shutting down your metabolic rate. You're slowing down your breathing. You're slowing down your circulation. Within three minutes of having sat down, your body has shut down up to 40% of its electrical energy. So these are things we need to really think about, because it, it, it will take years off your life. And you, all these stories are all. <laughs> anyone want to get up now? <laughs> and it, it, this, the posture that it gives you is this sort of natural, balanced posture that if you ever see somebody in zero Gs, or if you go and you jump into a pool and you let yourself go, you sort of, this is where your body wants to be. A slightly, op very open hip flexor. So as soon as you drop your knees, your, your pelvis becomes more, more erect, and your, your arms sort of flow out of the side. Obviously, when you're working, gravity pulls your arms down. But this is an important, uh, important thing to, to note. So let's talk about childhood obesity and sitting in school. This is, this is something that is it's a psychosocial issue that uh, if you know, kids get to school, they're overweight, they're very self-conscious. It's because we've been sitting since we were in a high chair. We designed these high chairs, and we want the kids to be at the table with us, starting from a very young age, sitting down. So uh, these, these are challenges that, that we're looking at now. So we're starting to, to look at the, the condition of, of kids and the condition of classrooms, where kids get bored sitting. They're, they're just shutting down. And anyone out there have an idea what, so BIFMA is the organization that sort of gives ratings of how, how much weight you need to design a certain product for. Anyone out there know, uh, for a fifth grader, how much weight does a, does a current fifth uh, seat for a fifth grader have to uh, compensate for? 110? Higher. 150? Higher. 250? 200 pounds. 200 pounds for a fifth grader is, is what all seats need to be designed to accommodate these days. That's pretty scary. So we're starting to look at upright desks for students. So right now we're building furniture for offices, which is obviously where the money is. There's no money in schools. But I'm, I'm hell-bent on, uh, oh, there I gave another, it was another cuss word, so sorry about that. Um, that's about as far as I'll go. Um, I'm hell-bent on really trying to stop this epidemic at, at the beginning, where we learn to sit. We learn to sit for learning. I believe if we can break it there, if we can develop uh, dynamic uh, classrooms where kids are encouraged to be up, maybe they have some foot support. Maybe they have some, uh, some sort of back support. This is a, some early prototypes we started working on. It's a, lot, it's a, it's a, it's a big project. It, it's going to take a lot of money. And right now, we're focusing on trying to keep our business alive, which is building product for for businesses. So uh, any, anyone out there wants to throw some money our way as a, as a research grant, we could use a couple hundred thousand dollars to, you know, to finish this project. Um, but it's, it's something that I think is incredibly worthwhile. So I want to I uh, teach new habits. I want to have kids uh, more e engaged in classrooms, physically engaged in the classroom, because then they'll be more cognitively engaged. Yeah, no, I'm almost done here. So this is, this is it, a, 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 a little phrase from uh, Nietzsche here, that we all know what in our body what we need. We just need to be aware and listen to it. You know, understand what's, what's hurting and do something about it. So even with kids, they know, they know what they need, but it's something we're afraid to, to believe because we want to be just like everybody else. We want to fit in, and I don't want to fit in. I want to. I want to disrupt everything. I want to change the way, the course of history. I want to change the. 
I want to get everyone out of chairs. I believe sitting is the new smoking, which is something that has, has been uh, in the media these days. And I think 10 years from now, we can look at the chair, just like we now look at a cigarette that somebody lights up on, the, on an airplane you know, 30 years ago. And you'd be disgusted if people are sitting down at, for work all day. The chair was designed for leisure. It wasn't designed for work. Our bodies were designed to be up and active and engaged. Thank you.